Okay, we will uh, are officially starting the uh, the class, continuing with the molecular relationship. Just to recap, last time we talked about uh, the creation of the molecules and uh, the the thing that will make the molecule different will be a link with a hierarchy. And uh, the way the link with the hierarchy works isn't something that anyone on this side of the veil can just create. Uh, it has to be uh, linked by a member of the hierarchy on the other side. And uh, this will happen similar to what we did in the meditation we just went through where the uh, the the uh, Christ or one with a Christ consciousness will enter into uh, one of the people in the group and create the link. Uh, this will happen when the hierarchy sees that uh, the creation of a molecule is possible. It's not something that a group can get together and say, we're going to make this happen. <laughs> but uh, I have received a revelation that this is a possibility for us. And uh, so that's why we are proceeding with the possibility that we can create a, a, a group together with enough oneness so that uh, the, the hierarchy can look upon it and say, well, we uh, think this group has possibilities to create the beginning of the molecular relationship. So we will make a link. Then when the link has happened, then the next step will be to link the entire group, like on the day of Pentecost when the apostles were linked and the fire appeared above the heads of everyone in the group. And uh, then they all felt the presence of the Christ at one time. And they were all endowed uh, with a link. Now, after, uh, after the meeting, uh, uh, there were probably times when they felt closer or farther away from the link, depending on their state of consciousness. But overall, the uh, the apostles were uh, uh, maintained that link enough to create a miraculous initiation of a, uh, uh, a movement that still affects the world in a positive way today. Now, people look at the Christian religion and they think, well, it had a lot of flaws. Well, yeah, we had a lot of negative people creep into it, make changes, try to change it back to just being a regular organization. And But despite all the attempts of darkness to frustrate the teachings of Christ, the pure teachings of Christ have still remained and have influenced the world for good, like to love your neighbor as yourself and uh, his teachings about love and acceptance inclusiveness uh, the, the most important teachings still remain as the ideal the golden rule all these things sermon on the mount all the things that he put before us including the example of his life of service and the hope of the resurrection, all these things have uh, created an influence for good. And that's often overlooked by the critics of religion as to all the good that has come to the world because of the teachings of Christ. Look how different the world is despite its faults. Look how different it is compared to 2000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, slavery was common. Not only uh, the black race, but all races suffered slavery. Uh, it was, if you, uh, 
if you needed some extra money, well, you sold your kid into slavery. You know, <laughs> that was a very common thing. And it didn't matter what race you were back then. The, uh, uh, everyone was in danger of, of slavery. And it was a common thing in, among all peoples. And it was common to uh, just look on animals as uh, be uh, as if you didn't need to worry about their suffering and you, and people people were not very uh, uh, kind to animals back in those days. Back in those days, a dog was considered a big nuisance and and people uh, uh, didn't treat them well at all. And uh, for instance, except on rare occasions. So, <clears throat> and people helping each other. Uh, there's organizations, beneficial organizations throughout the world that are dedicated to alleviating suffering. And back in 2000 years ago, when Christ appeared, uh, there was hardly anything dedicated to alleviating human suffering. Uh, so there's, we, we still have a long way to go, <clears throat> but what is overlooked is how much the consciousness of humanity has progressed toward the light despite our faults. Uh, there's a lot more uh, intention among the, the masses of humanity to do good than there was back 2000 years ago. So progress has been made and that's often overlooked. When I was a kid and attending church, I often heard the, the statement that we live in the wickedest time in history, that people are more wicked now than ever. And that never really settled right with me. And when, when I read that uh, a statement from DK about that, uh, the opposite being true, I thought, you know, he's entirely right. We are, we are making progress. This isn't the wickedest, <laughs> e evilest, generation that's ever existed you know and uh, of course there's always evil and negativity somewhere but we as a human race are making progress and so uh, what uh, the beginning of the molecular re relationship will be this link and it's not something that you can say, we're going to create an organization and it's gonna have that link. No, what uh, has to happen is we pick up that the molecular concept is part of the plan. We put the ingredients together and if we are successful and if we put together something that's usable, then the hierarchy will make the link. It's up to them, it's not up to us. And uh, I feel uh, the, the presence closer now than it was earlier. So that is, that is a good, that's a good sign that we're headed in the right direction. And so once the once a link is made and the first molecule is in existence, then it will begin to multiply. And now for the complete success of the uh, uh, molecular order, it, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Well, the first molecule was 2000 years ago and uh, and we don't have a historical record of uh, anyone since. And so uh, who knows how long it's going to take, but we have to do our part in making the next step. And eventually the molecular order will cover the entire planet and be used everywhere. And uh, all kinds of different molecules will be created. An essential ingredient in the molecule will be the leadership how leadership in the molecule works. And this, this is what we're gonna talk about today. Now, leadership in regular bureaucracies and big business is really sluggish because the positions 
uh, are filled from the top down. In the molecular relationship, the principle is the opposite. It's established uh, from the bottom up by the power of election. So uh, it's interesting in a regular uh, bureaucracy, <clears throat> in a regular, say a big business, you, uh, you join as an employee and if you want to move up, it doesn't matter how much the rank and fire file like you. What matters is the guy above you, how much what he thinks about you. And one of the problems with you moving up is if the guy above you thinks that uh, you are so good that you could be his replacement, then he's actually going to put roadblocks in your way and he's going to pick somebody else for the next uh, uh, advancement and he's going to overlook you. And this often happens in, in businesses and, and bureaucracies is that uh, people want to hold on to their power. And you notice this with our politicians today. Power is the most important thing to them. And you, you see these politicians, they will even risk financial danger to save their power. Saving their power is more, more important to them than anything else. More important to them than being liked, more important to them than money, uh, even more important to them than sex. They, they want to hold on to, the, they're holding on to their powers, number one. So you can see these, a lot of these powers, uh, politicians, how they seek power and to hold on to it at all costs. And uh, power is a funny thing. We think, uh, we think money corrupts people more than anything or sex corrupts people, but power is the most uh, uh, tempting force for corruption, yet People think it's the easiest thing for them to handle. Uh, the individual thinks, boy, if I had power, I would really use it for good. That's what everybody thinks. But then when they get it, then uh, it's, the, it's the easiest way to get corrupted is to get power and then uh, uh, use it uh, to maintain your power. But so th this is what happened. You, you join a business. Uh, you as an employee and you want to move up in the business uh, Say if it's a big business you want to move up the guy above you is a guy with a hundred percent Ability to decide where you're gonna go Your fellow employees may think you're doing a great job now if your fellow employees think you're doing a great job and your boss thinks yeah, he's 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 uh, smart and everything, but if I advance him, he, you know, he could threaten me and replace me. So he, what he, when it comes time for advancing somebody in the group, the boss picks somebody kind of melt toast that's not a threat to him. And he overlooks the guy that really should have the position because he's threatened by that guy. So he picks somebody that's not a threat. And already worked in the bureaucracy when I first met her, she worked for the government and she noticed this happening all the time. But uh, uh, matter of fact, her boss was picked. He was just had no talent whatsoever, but he played golf with uh, the, the guy above him. And he wasn't any threat to him because he had absolutely no talent. <laughs> and no ability. And so he, he was picked to be uh, uh, Artie's boss instead of Artie being picked, for instance, or anyone else. There were other people with uh, a lot more talent than this guy, but he, Artie said he was the least, had the least of ability of anybody that could have been promoted to be her boss. And uh, he, <clears throat> when, when Artie came and presented uh, some ideas to him, uh, he used to say stuff to her like, Artie, you just think too much. <laughs> just go just go back and do your job, you know, don't worry about this. And so um, <clears throat> he, he wasn't interested in doing anything. And when they went to meetings and conferences, 
which were pretty much a waste of time anyway. He just uh, uh, rubbed shoulders with everybody and uh, uh, had a good time and didn't really do anything to to help uh, uh, increase effectiveness of anything. But this, this happened. So he was picked because he was not a threat. Now, this uh, guy named Michael Corda, I think his name was back around the 70s or something, wrote this book called Power. And he told how to get power in a regular organization. And he says, the way to do it, <clears throat> he says, if your boss, and he, he pointed this out, if your boss thinks that you are a threat to him in any way, he says, your, your advancement in the company is pretty much due. He says, so here's how, here's, he, he presented a plan to people as to how to get ahead in a big business. He says, you have to deceive your boss and the thinking that you are dedicated to helping him and you have to make him think that you want to make his job better and easier and you have no intention of taking his power, but you have to in you have to actually deceive him because you have to uh, you have to have the intention to replace him. <laughs> he says this, and he tells you uh, how to go about it to deceive your boss. He says, and the thinking that you have his best interests in ha at, in in your head, and then you sabotage him but you don't let him know you're sabotaging. So you, you, you make him think, you, all your actions that your boss sees, you are just dedicated to making him look good. But then on the other hand, you do things to sabotage him so you eventually replace him. And the whole book was around that idea. And <laughs> I thought it was a fascinating book, but I thought, well, what a cutthroat way to live though. You know, this, this is not, but this is pretty much the way it is. And then, then you have the Peter principle applies in regular business where you advance until you reach a point to where you advance to the end of your ability. And so somebody thinks, well, this guy is pretty good in this, so we're gonna move him. He's an engineer, we'll move him into management. Well, he's a good engineer, but then he turns out to be a terrible manager. And then the business thinks, well, he's not any good there, so, so uh, we can't demote him now. We promoted him, so no, we can't really demote him, so uh, we'll just have to leave him there. And that's the Peter principle, is that people advance until they get in a position where they're no good at it, and then they're just left there. And this was what makes the bureaucracies so inefficient is the Peter principle, you have people advancing in positions where they're no good. Now, he, he, uh, Peter talks about uh, AT&T, which was uh, one of the biggest businesses at the time the book was written. The people at AT&T were, um, uh, they had a lot of people advance in these in the positions where all of a sudden they become useless. So instead of demoting them, making a manager back in an engineer again or something like that, something where he was useful, they had this uh, building that they created that they sent all these people to that were useless and this, this had them shuffle around papers. And so they continued to work and they were completely useless. <laughs> but they wanted to... Uh, AT&T wanted to segregate these people that were useless so they weren't interfering with everybody else that was useful because they, they didn't dare fire them because they thought they might be sued or something. So they, uh, they put them in a separate building <laughs> that they built just for the useless people. Now, I don't know if they realized that they were in the building of the useless people, but uh, uh, it was an interesting story I read may not even be true, I don't know. You read the stuff like that, you never know if it's true or not. But anyway, I read that. And it's, it's uh, completely incredible that a company might do something like that. So anyway, we have uh, tremendous bottlenecks and problems in uh, 
business as we and hierarchies as we have today. The most effective businesses right now are small businesses where you have the initiate, which is the owner of the business. He may have a half a dozen employees and everything operates pretty efficiently. Say somebody has a restaurant, they have maybe a dozen employees and the owner is there, he's taken charge and it, you, you'll find that, you know, a small business like that, it's run very efficiently. Now, Curtis and I used to sell signs and Curtis, you can tell us what's the difference between calling on a big business to sell a sign to and a small business where you can talk to the owner? Well, the owner makes a decision, the uh, small business. You go into uh, a franchise, no one has power to make a decision, but the little guy does, you know. So. Yeah. You go into the cell with a little, little guy, he gives you a yes or no within 10 minutes. And the decision is made. You go to a big business and boy, it's, it's a Herculean task to sell them anything. You show them, you show them the sign and you say, now you got, uh, you got 30 uh, uh, businesses in different states and everything. And boy, if you, uh, if you bought the, these signs for all your uh, businesses, uh, uh, would really be a good thing. And we could give you a good price because you'd buy a whole bunch of them. And, they, and what do you get for response? They'll say, well, uh, give us uh, information on it and we'll present it to a committee and we'll get back to you in a month. <laughs> I had that. The only time I ever had that work for me was with Kentucky Fried Chicken. One time, I left them a card and got an order for thirty signs. That was the yeah. only time. I yeah, I that. printed up ten thousand of those cards and handed out ten ten thousand of them. And Curtis Curtis joined me, and I taught him how to sell these signs. And I give him just two, three cards, and he handed out one. And he got that order that I had never got. I had now 10,000 of them and nobody ever ordered anything. And he hands out one and he gets this great big order. <laughs> I thought, wow, I can't believe it. <laughs> I think I found a dollar on the, on the ground that day. <laughs> <laughs> that was so weird. But uh, um, so anyway. Always, but anyway. you're right, businesses today, the little, the little man, the little business, they're the ones that are the most successful. You know, I've had a handful of people work for me and I've done very well, but uh, that's because it's just one person that's making the decisions. Yeah, but when they get big and they start having a bureaucracy, uh, they have all these uh, leadership problems, then they get sluggish and to get anything done is like uh, moving a mountain with these guys. I mean, uh, uh, that's why when businesses get big, they start creating flaws like, say, uh, uh, Google and Facebook, all these big businesses, people are getting really disgruntled with them right now. So, you know, sooner or later, they're going to be uh, having little upstarts come along that are much more efficient because they don't have the internal bureaucracy uh, as, as the big ones. And then eventually... Uh, uh, they, they, they become competitive. Uh, let's hope that happens. I mean, uh, these, these internet, uh, businesses are so big and powerful. They're going to be uh, hard to compete against if they really have a monopoly going right now. Okay. Hey, Joe. Yeah. If you, uh, if you're in a, a competitive market, uh, with a lot of other people in a, in a business, you need to read this book by Robert Greene, uh, the, the uh, 48 Laws of Power. Oh, And it'll cool. tell you, it was written by the same guy who wrote The Art of Seduction. And he'll well, tell you how to rise. Uh, like the, like his, for, the first of these 48 says, never outshine your boss, like you were saying earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Never, never try to look brighter than your boss. Always kind of kowtow 
Yeah, that's that. That's that other book. It was called Power too. Just the word power, and Michael Corda wrote it back in the seventies. Similar idea, except he, what about he Tony Robbins. Tony... Yeah. Right. Tony Robbins wrote a book, Unlimited Power, about uh, what was that about? Is that about just that's more like personal, personal power. power. Yeah. Personal power. Yeah, that was a pretty good book too. But if you want to rise in your company, get this book, and I'll tell you it. It's very seductive in what you do and what you say and how to uh, manipulate. Is he supportive of cutthroat methods to do it or is he? Cutthroat, yeah. Get other people to do you, your work and take the credit kind of thing. Learn to keep people dependent upon you. Yeah, that sounds like the book that I read a lot, yeah. yeah. And most of your friend work as a spy. <laughs> you know. What is Robert Green also wrote a lot of caveats for each of those 48 laws. So it's not just always the same. You know, there's sometimes when you just have to strike out and kill everybody. Remember the, the case in, in Russia where the guy just have to, uh, something terrible, just have to strike at everybody. So there's a caveat to each of those 48 laws. So let's not just, I think it's the balance that is important. Yeah. Okay, now in the molecule, it's going to be different. Um, the leadership is based from the uh, uh, bottom up and you're, to move ahead in leadership in the molecular order, you're not dependent on the guy above you. He can recommend, but you're actually voted in. But uh, uh, So there's two ways to advance in the molecule. One is by initiation and the other by uh, election. Now, right now, the, uh, the principle of the molecular order that is at play in the free countries is initiation. Let's suppose that uh, you want to create a business, okay? If you're living in a free country, you can say, well, I want to create a pizza shop, so I'm going to make the best pizza available. So he, he, he rents a, a, a space, and gets everything in there, hires some employees, and he initiated the business. He paid for it, blood, sweat, and tears, so to speak. And he's the one in charge because he initiated it. And so... That, this is why the uh, small businesses are so efficient is because they're all run by an initiate, somebody that actually come up with the plan and implemented the plan and uh, started it going. The difference between a small business and a big business is many of the big businesses have been around for a long time and the original initiates are gone and they're taken over by people that are not elected, but appointed by somebody. And so this uh, uh, makes a, 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 a tremendous difference. Like so, Apple computer? Yeah. Yeah, Apple computer's interesting example is Steve Jobs initiated it, and then they actually fired him. The board actually fired him from his own company. And then after he left, they almost went under. I mean, they started their computer quality, went way down. Everything was down. And they were just about to go under. And then they thought, well, let's bring Steve Jobs back. <laughs> they brought him back in. He introduced a brand new uh, model that turned everything around and then introduced the uh, uh, iPod. And uh, that the iPod really changed everything. And uh, then the iPhone. And uh, so that was really an example of how the, the person that initiates something has the vision, okay? The people that are brought in afterwards, some of them have the vision, but you can't guarantee it. And usually the leadership is appointed. And like I say, the people with the true vision are often overlooked because they're the threat. So uh, uh, when the initiate leaves the company, then the company turns into a bureaucracy that becomes very sluggish 
and eventually uh, uh, loses a lot of power. Like IBM was once a very powerful company. And then Bill Gates, uh, initiate Bill Gates comes along and he sees a tremendous opportunity in this uh, uh, program they, uh, they wrote for uh, uh, computers. And so he offers to buy it from them and they didn't see any value in it. I mean, the bureaucrats are. Now, the, some, some, I bet there was a handful that did see value in it like Bill Gates did, but they were probably ignored or probably demoted, <laughs> probably never got anywhere. But uh, the bureaucrats didn't see anything valuable, so they let Bill Gates have this uh, computer program that eventually became uh, Windows and runs all their software right now. And he became the richest man on the planet for a period of time. Uh, and if uh, IBM could have had the vision to see that, uh, look what they could have done. They could have become the most powerful company in the world, but now they're just kind of a, they've lost a, a lot of their power because they just didn't have the vision. He had the vision of, of putting a personal computer in everybody's home. That was his vision. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't, uh, they didn't have that vision. Okay. They wanted to keep all the power to themselves. That was their problem. So, so uh, we do have at play in the world initiates, people are in, initiating a number of things. Now, what all do people initiate besides businesses? Business, small business is the most common thing that people initiate on their own. Uh, a lot of people dream of having a successful business, but have you heard of what percentage of businesses fail after somebody tries to initiate one? Do you know what the percentage is? It's about 90%. 90% fail over, I can't remember how many years, over like a four or five year time period, about 90% of them will fail. It just shows you how difficult initiation is, is that it's not a piece of cake to initiate a business or anything else, to initiate something new that actually will actually work over a sustained period of time uh, is very difficult. So when uh, I used to sell to businesses I, and I come across somebody who's really got a good one going and been in business for a while, you know, I always admired that person because I thought this person has to have some uh, really, uh, really good intelligence about him to hold everything together and make every make everything work. And so I've always admired uh, s uh, small business owners that are able to uh, uh, be successful because it, a lot of people think it's easy. They think, boy, it's uh, I'll just start this restaurant or I'll just start this. Uh, 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 business, landscaping business, or whatever it is they want to do, or this gift shop, or whatever, and I'll make this easy money, <laughs> and I'll be in charge, but uh, when they get involved, then uh, they all of a sudden find out, boy, if I want to make this succeed, I'm going to have to work like 16 hours a day, maybe, I'm, boy, this is a lot harder than I thought it was, and they find out it's, it's very difficult to really make a, uh, an, a new thing that you initiate work, it takes a tremendous amount of focus and intention and energy to make it work, a lot more than people think. That's why about 90% eventually uh, fail. Um, so what, what else besides businesses do, uh, uh, is the power of initiation uh, uh, used in. Think about that. What do you think? Religions. Uh, yeah, people start religious groups, uh, say a study group. That's the power of initiation. And to cre even create a, like a study group takes, uh, takes a lot of focus. Just putting the word out. If you, if you have something boring, well, you're not going to get anybody uh, wanting to get together with a study group. But if you got something kind of unique, a good twist on it, then uh, uh, 
you can gather people together, but after you, after you gather them together, if you don't hold their attention, then they won't come back. So initiating even a simple thing like a, a study group, uh, and some religions began like study group, like Jehovah's Witnesses began with, as a Bible study group. A bunch of people got together just to study the Bible, see what it had to say, and then eventually uh, it expanded and turned into religion. And uh, so uh, you never know where something initiated uh, is going to lead. Okay, what else besides uh, that uh, uh, the people initiate? Well, different political groups have been formed over the over the ages. Yeah, political group packs. Uh, say you want to accomplish a certain thing. Uh, um, like in California, they had the one percent initiative. To, they they felt their uh, property taxes were too high. They want to limit it to one percent. So uh, Ward Conley, as his name was, uh, uh, started the one percent initiative. So Ward Conley was uh, an initiate there, and he come up with the idea: let's just do one percent, and we can't tax anybody more than one percent of their property values. Uh, for the year and uh, that uh, people really liked that idea and the establishment didn't like it at all, but uh, the people liked it. And so it eventually went through and then after it went through, they kind of sabotaged it in a number of ways because <laughs> the establishment doesn't like the idea of low taxes. Um, so, but anyway, that's another one. Uh, anything else? Yeah, musical groups, bands, rock and roll bands. How hard is it to put one of those together? Yeah, would you say the Beatles were initiates? Beatles were the, they were all initiates. That's what made them famous is they were all four frontmen and they all combined in a way that they synthesized their energy. They, they actually created a molecule. And, and uh, uh, Elvis was an initiate because he changed the direction of music. So uh, he, uh, yeah, he put a whole new flavor in the musical world. Now there was music like his, and some some groups complain Elvis kind of stole our ideas. But but the important thing was uh, ideas are like they say are a dime or a dime a dozen. Just coming up with an idea isn't enough. But initiating the idea that's where the real energy has to come in because implementing an idea is much more difficult than coming up with the idea. It's like uh, uh, Steve Jobs got together with uh, uh, Wassenich or whatever his name was, I can't remember his name, and they were co-creators really. But uh, the other guy was the idea guy, whereas Steve was the promotion guy. And when, it, when everything is, the dust is settled. We don't even remember that other guy that founded Apple. We only remember Steve because he was the guy that got everything in motion. And that is the most difficult. And on hindsight, a lot of people think, well, he doesn't really deserve much credit. Let's take Columbus, for instance. It's discovered now, a lot of historians say, well, Columbus really wasn't the first to discover America. The Vikings and maybe the Chinese and other people discovered America long before Columbus, so Columbus shouldn't get any credit. But Columbus did more than discover America, as he initiated the movement of the Western world, or the, uh, the Eastern world to the Western world. And he initiated that whole thing, and, and that's, what makes Columbus significant. It wasn't the fact that he just discovered that America was there. It was the fact that he initiated an entire change in civilization. And if, uh, that's, that's what made it, well, it was of much more significance than the fact that he just discovered a new world existed. And so uh, the power of initiation is, uh, um, uh, shows up a number of ways. Okay, what else uh, do people initiate? Jesus. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was a, probably the greatest initiator of all times. Initiated a yeah. tremendous uh, 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 movement. Okay. How about uh, Nikola Tesla? Was he an initiate? No, he was just a. He just followed Edison. And Edison, he was an initiate too. But yeah, inventor, an inventor that invents something that actually uh, uh, changes society that's, uh, uh, and actually gets the invention uh, introduced. Now, there's a lot of really good inventive minds out there that come up. Now, you look, if you've ever filed anything with a patent office, what's interesting is no matter what idea you come up with when they do a patent search, there's about a hundred different uh, patents that, and patent applications that are similar to just about anything you can throw in there. And it's amazing how many things, ideas are in circulation. If you want ideas, you go to the patent office and look, look, at, look at all those things in there. And there's ideas, of, there's millions of ideas that nobody's done anything with. It's amazing. Uh, you, you'd be amazed at what you could find. Matter of fact, if, if you wanted to uh, come up with something, uh, just go to the patent office. I haven't been there myself, but I just know that there's a lot of stuff there. You could go through that and probably come up with some interesting ideas if you wanted to find something to manufacture that was new and unique. There's a lot of buried ideas in the patent office and nobody's done anything with. So coming up with the idea isn't, isn't enough. A lot of people come up with ideas. And I've heard so many people say, yeah, you know, look at this thing out here. Uh, this guy's making a million dollars. I come up with that idea, that idea first. I've heard people say that before. Uh, but coming up with ideas isn't enough. <laughs> Implementing the idea is the difficult part. And so, uh, uh, that's why we recognized like uh, uh, the alternating current by Tesla was, was an idea that was implemented and it changed the entire world. We have alternating current rather than DC currents in our house, thanks to uh, Nikola Tesla. It was an idea whose time had come. I mean, we wouldn't have the, the uh, technology that we have today without Tesla. We wouldn't have had uh, the space age without Tesla. We wouldn't have most of the things that you look around without alternating current. We wouldn't. We would not have uh, dishwashers, dryers. We wouldn't have any of that. He had hundreds of patents. Oh yeah, and he, and had, he had no competition. There was no one out there with his. And his yeah. ideas are still not implemented, all of them, like he had a wireless transmission of electricity that he actually uh, demonstrated to a degree that we still don't know uh, exactly how he did all those things. And he was able to, to uh, uh, adjust his body so he could have millions of volts of electricity go through his body and without being hurt. And he demonstrated that and had parties where he had uh, millions of volts go through his body and and everybody thought well that's pretty cool <laughs> you know? yeah they'd try and get electrocuted <laughs> it was funny I read a story uh, I when I got interested in Tesla I went to the library and did research of old articles and old magazines that the library had in stock and I re read them and I read one interesting one that I've never read in any book but it was a article written in a magazine from I think the 1940s or some. And anyway, anyway uh, it was in New York where Tesla had this laboratory and every couple of days there was like a mini earthquake that just shook the whole town and everybody was wondering, well, what the devil's causing this? And the police department or, or some investigative I can't remember the police or FBI or somebody was thinking, well, you know, maybe Tesla's behind this because he's always doing this weird stuff and he had a laboratory there. So they got 
a search warrant to go in and bust into Tesla's laboratory. And uh, anyway, the the time they selected to go into his laboratory was during the time the, the city was having this quake, just uh, just enough so that you could feel it. You know, the whole city was quaking. And so they thought, I might be Tesla. This is the time to go bust in his laboratory. So they burst, broke in the door and went in his laboratory. And Tesla had this device in the center of the room there that was on and kind of rumbling around. And when Tesla saw them, he picked up a sledgehammer and he smashed it. And when he smashed it, the whole vibration of the whole city stopped. <laughs> I remember you telling me that story. Yeah. So I haven't read that anywhere else. And I've read several books on Tesla and it wasn't in the book, but it was in this old magazine that I had read that I dug out of the library that was, you know, the magazine was 50, 60 years old. And uh, so I thought that was a pretty fascinating story. <laughs> anyway. What's interesting about Tesla is he he didn't he wasn't in it for the money. He was just in it because he saw a need and filled it. Yeah, uh, you know that's it wasn't like Edison that way. So anyway, anyway, the big difference in how the molecule works for for government is number one initiation. The second is election. In a regular business, if you want promoted, you got to please make the guy that's uh, ahead of you think that you're no threat to him and you're for his best good and maybe play golf with him and let him win and <laughs> all this stuff. And uh, But in the molecular relationship, the, it's by the power of election. You're, uh, if you want to get ahead in the molecular relationship, you convince the people that you're working with, not, your, not the guy above you, but the people that are your peers, that you're capable of doing a good job and making, their, making everything better for the group of which they're involved. And that's where we're going to take off and talk about next week. So any uh, questions or comments before we wrap it up here? Well, when I played trumpet in the band, um, you challenged the person ahead of you to, if you were in third chair, you challenged the person in second chair. And if you could play a better tune, then you were voted up and then you just trade rated places. Yeah. That, you could go as high as you wanted. That's a molecular principle at work right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that's what we're going to talk about next week. So until then, we uh, have, a, have a happy Super Bowl, everybody. And go Buccaneers. Go Brady. <laughs> <laughs> right. See you have next. a good week, everybody. Thank you, JJ. Good class. Yeah, good nice. Class. Very interesting. Thank you. Nice group today. <laughs>